Boston and I'll still have more to learn. She's just an infinite yeah. mystery. That is fascinating. They say New York has the safest tap water. Do you believe that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen tests with New York tap water that are a little bit harrowing. And I would say in general, it's best not to trust the matrix for your water, mm. period. That the, the best thing to do is just go straight back to the source, to go straight back to nature. All right, guys, we got Isabel Friend here today. We're going to talk water. Let's talk water. Let's Thanks for it. having me. Absolutely. What got you on this water journey? Uh, well, my water journey started back in 2009. I was living in Brooklyn and I was a nutritionist at the time. I was studying nutrigenomics, mm. which is how the food that we eat actually affects our gene expression. And I was starting to realize, wow, when we rewild our diet and we eat wild, non-domesticated food, we have more of a non-domesticated gene expression. We're closer to our wild progenitors. And I started to think, what if we drink wild water? Because mm. the water that we drink is far more important than the food that we eat. You know, it determines how much of the nutrients actually get drawn across into the cells through that osmotic process. And we are vastly water as beings. So I started wild crafting and harvesting all of my water from springs. And that really set me on a path because it, wow. it shifted everything in my mind, body and spirit on subtle levels. And that's when I discovered the work of Victor Schauberger who was an Austrian naturalist who had a better understanding of water than even the world's modern hydrologists today, mm. or even then we'll get to, you know, in the next few hundred years with the, the rate that modern hydrology is going. And that's when I really fell in love with water and realized that water contains the solutions for all of life's toughest questions, whether they're questions of health biology and medicine, or there are questions of sociology or economics or spirituality or agriculture or uh, even energy, even free energy solutions that as the source of life, water contains the answers to life's questions. So that's kind of what set me on the path mm. back in the day about 15 years ago now. And wow. It's never faded. I still get to learn something new about water all the time, even in 15 years of research. And I know for the rest of my life, I'll keep studying it and I'll still have more to learn. She's just an infinite yeah. mystery. That is fascinating. They say New York has the safest tap water. Do you believe that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well... I've seen tests with New York tap water that are a little bit harrowing. And I would say in general, it's best not to trust the matrix for your water, mm. period. That the, the best thing to do is just go straight back to the source, to go straight back to nature. Because there is a, a strange, almost slave-like paradigm that happens when we pay for our own bloodstream. So the water that you drink becomes your blood within five minutes of drinking it, which means that if you're drinking tap water, you're paying the government, you're paying the municipal government for your own bloodstream. Mm. And you're kind of abdicating your own sovereignty and, and your sanguine health to trusting, you know, that they're creating something clean and pure for right. you, which of course we know that they're not, even in the highest quality tap water areas. It's not even really tap water with everything that they put in there. It's tap liquid. Mm. And if you're buying bottled water, the same is true. You are paying a company for your bloodstream. So nature has set it up in this perfectly reciprocal paradigm where we are designed to be interwoven with the watershed and to be an integral part of all of the living beings in our ecosystem and in our environment. We actually share a bloodstream with all living beings. When wow. water is outside of us, we call it water. When it's inside of us, we call it blood. But fundamentally, it's the same living life force. And when you harvest water from a spring, you're tapping into this direct communion with the source that is so empowering that I've seen it shift people's entire sense of personal sovereignty in their lives and in the world because suddenly they belong to the land that they're on. Mm. They're not outsourcing their bloodstream to Fiji and Evian <laughs> France and the Alps, but you get this incredible sense of, of groundedness and centeredness when you harvest from wild springs. So maybe... New York tap water is better than L.A. or better than Las Vegas. But in all of those major metropolises, Atlanta, Chicago, all of these cities, you will find at least 52 different pharmaceutical medications flowing through that tap water because Jeez. they use a closed loop system, a toilet to tap system, which is basically this vampiric system of like mutual drugging because people are ingesting all of these pharmaceuticals and then peeing them out. And then that water gets recycled and they're not able to filter out these fine, fine, fine submicron doses of pharmaceuticals. So wow. whether it is, um, you know, opiates or uh, birth control medication, you name it, everything is found in, in New York City tap water <laughs> and here in L.A. And that is crazy. It I is crazy. I did not know toilet bowls were connected to tap water. 
In a lot of cities, yeah, they call it a closed loop system. That's toilet disgusting. To tap. Oh my gosh. It's nasty. So people are <laughs> and then you're drinking it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And and when you think about it, I mean, the drugs are in there because people are peeing them out. Well, what is pee? It's basically filtered blood plasma with urea and protein. So you're drinking people's filtered blood. That's why it's this <laughs> weirdly vampiric system yeah, that literally. Is, is so antithetical to nature. Wow. So if people are watching this and they want to harvest their own water, what's the process for that? Is it expensive? Not at all. It's actually free water. Mm. You know, water is meant to be free and it is birthed um, prolifically from our mother earth at these springs that are more common than people realize. Usually, depending on where you are in the country, it's never more than an hour's drive away. And some mm -hmm. people will drive an hour just to get to the airport. So it's it's worth driving an hour to get high quality water if you have to. Um, you can go to a site called findaspring.com mm -hmm. to find where your local springs are. And you can go to waterislife.shop under the forage tab and you'll see all of the materials that you need to forage. You'll see water evaluation tests and bottles and all kinds of harvesting tools. Nice. And is it safe to drink or do you need to filter it? In 99 cases out of 100, I would say maybe even 999 cases out of 1,000, it's absolutely safe. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. It's actually some of the cleanest water on earth because the earth has its own natural filtration process through these geological layers. Mm. And this water has been underground deep under the earth inside of aquifers for decades, sometimes even hundreds of years, depending on the depth of the aquifer. And so this water, and oftentimes is the cleanest thing we'll ever actually touch in our lives because it's been around since before the invention of pollution, since before the industrial revolution, at least. Right. And so it rises perfectly pure and pristine. And it's, it's the most life-giving, vibrant, vital water that you'll drink. Drinking living water is a completely different experience than drinking dormant comatose bulk water and that's what most people are accustomed to and that's why most people are not getting well hydrated mm. so what makes it living are there or microorganisms in there yes so there's microorganisms in there that are you know nature's probiotic that our biology ex expects of us right mm. um there's also a lot of a lot more conductivity in the water because you have molecular structure so all of the hydrogens in the water are bonded together giving it this symmetry and this crystallinity that allows the water to be much more bioavailable and the water has um, a, a vivacity a vitality to it it has literally a different charge a different energy to it wow that is fascinating they say mm -hmm. water has memories too absolutely you believe that I believe that water is the storehouse of memory on our planet mm. and that water is the sensory organ of nature so water is acutely sensitive to its environment. It is always seeing and hearing and feeling and perceiving it. all of the subtle stimuli, the, the vibratory stimuli, auditory stimuli, visual stimuli. It's picking all of that up. And then within these molecular clusters of, of hydrogen bonded molecules, which can range from 30 to 60 molecules in size, you have at minimum 440,000 panels per cluster. Mm. And each one of these panels is responsible for sensing, storing, amplifying, transducing, and transmitting energy vibration and frequency. So water will absorb that information and then actually be able to amplify and transmit that information back into the environment again. In fact, this is one of water's primary roles and primary functions in nature is not just to hydrate us as an inert substance, which is kind of what we assume of water, but that it's actually giving us the vibratory information that we need to thrive within our ecosystem. So for example, coherent full spectrum water contains the entire spectrum of light codes and light frequencies mm. that are necessary for our circadian rhythms to function properly. Um, you know, water is even picking up on the, the sounds in the environment and translating that information into our biology. Wow. There was a researcher named Theodore Schwenk who proved that water is even sensitive to the subtle movements of the cosmos. So all of the planetary movements and alignments are being translated through water into our biology, actually weaving us into the greater symphony, the greater cosmic dance of, of the choreography of the heavens. Mm. But unfortunately, because of the way that we are treating water and the way that it's being bombarded with non-native signals and how it's being cut off from its exposure to nature, the water that we drink 
in most cases, is no longer able to transmit that information to us. So we're not getting the vibratory information. We're not getting the light information, and we're not getting the cosmic information from water that we're meant to be getting that again that our biology expects of us wow because that's what our ancestors drank for countless millennia and now we're getting this dormant devitalized uninformed water that is crazy and that's what people drink their whole lives exactly bottled water exactly and And it's no wonder that we end up feeling disconnected yeah there is a massive disconnect with spirituality right now right Mm -hmm. people don't even know that's the thing absolutely there's a disconnect with spirituality and then there's a disconnect between Uh, humans and nature and there's a disconnect between humans and each other Mm. as well and we see this really often especially with people who drink reverse osmosis or distilled water or these other waters that are actually aggressive solvents so there is absolutely no molecular structure organization there's no bonding in the the um, the molecular structure there and so Basically, all of these hydrogen bonds are forming and breaking apart billions of times per second. There's no time for these molecules to snuggle up and talk to each other and transmit information and communicate with one another. Mm. And we can see at every level, personally and collectively, that what we do to water, we do to ourselves, that water is our primordial mirror. And so when we drink water that is very disconnected at a molecular level, you see a lot of times those people tend to be slightly more isolated or slightly more aggressive or slightly more wow. um, just um, uh, volatile or, or their family relations are not quite as close and connected and peaceful as they could be. I see this with my clients all the time, that when you start drinking higher quality water, even the connections in your life start to change because you have more peace within yourself. Mm. You know, The water that we drink has a huge effect on our psychology and on our general resilience. Mm. You know, when you're hydrated, you're able to kind of let things flow off your back a little bit easier. You're not reactive to your environment right. as much. So it affects it, everything. Yeah, that's crazy. Is it true the body's like 70% water? That's true by volume. But molecularly speaking, we're actually 99.9% water molecules. Whoa. So for every thousand molecules in our body, 999 of them are water. That's crazy. Yes. People are drinking tap water. <laughs> yes, I know. You know, people think, oh, you know, I need to drink water because my body uses water. But the truth is your body is water. Mm. And most people, we were talking earlier, most people are dehydrated right now, right? The vast majority of people. So the most conservative estimates say that 75% of the population is dehydrated. <sighs> but if you talk to clinicians who are actually studying this in their labs, they're finding that around 98 to 100% of the population is dehydrated. What? Yes, that pe- everyone who comes into their office, regardless of whether they feel ill or feel well when they come in, suffers from some level of UCD or unintentional chronic dehydration. And part of the reason for this is that we have kind of a backwards idea of what hydration even is. We think that, oh, if I just drink more water, then I'll get hydrated. Right. But if that were the case, then we would all be hydrated. But when you take a phase angle test, which is the most effective measurement for hydration, you know, 12 is perfect hydration. Around four and below, you have um, cancer patients, you have um, a lot of different um, chronic diseases. Mm. You know, there's a direct correlation between dehydration and disease. Dehydration is at the root of all diseases. We're finding this over and over and over again. Mm. And then the general population bell curve is like around seven to eight. So that's still five points below 12. But what's interesting about this is that the phase angle test actually measures your prana, your mana, your chi, your cellular voltage. Mm. It's measuring how much energy is at the cell membranes because it's that energy that actually draws the water across. So when we're talking about your level of vitality and life force energy, it is the exact same measurement as your level of hydration. So wow. people walk around feeling tired and devitalized all the time because they are dehydrated because it's the water in our bodies that is the conductor that actually carries this electromagnetism, right? It's it's the conductor of all of that electrical energy and, mm. that, and that vitality in our bodies. So the vast, vast, vast majority, pretty much everyone is dehydrated. In fact, I can say for a fact that if you're watching this podcast, you are dehydrated, <laughs> <laughs> bar none, and that it's not just a matter of drinking more water, but it really is a, a lifestyle practice. Right, the right type of water. 
the right type of water and the lifestyle practices to make sure that your cells are actually primed to absorb and retain that water as right. well. So is there any brands you trust? I know making your own is probably the best way to do it, right? But is there any brands you buy for water? Absolutely. If I have to buy bottled water, I love Ophora. I love that you've got Ophora there. I love uh, deuterium depleted waters like Clarivia or light water. Mm. Um, there is another brand called gl uh, Glacier Water, sorry, Icelandic Water that, that is naturally somewhat deuterium depleted. It only has about 130 parts per million deuterium. Um, there's Black Water, which is really high in fulvic and humic minerals. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Yeah, there are a few good ones on the market. Do you trust any of these alkaline waters? Generally, no. It depends on what makes the water alkaline. So if it's naturally alkaline from an artesian spring, that's beautiful because it's alkaline because of the minerals that are in there. Mm. But the ones that have been made alkaline through electrolysis processes, I'm not a fan of that at all because electrolysis really destroys the molecular structure of the water. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating. I used to drink, uh, I forget the brand. Was it Smart Water? Yeah, Smart Water. Mm. What do you think of that one? I'm not a fan. Ah. Really high <laughs> levels of microplastics, unfortunately, and there are just better options. And you know, we have to we have to recognize that water is sacred. So no matter what water we have access to, even if it's just tap water, we're so blessed to have access to that water. That, that whatever water is in front of us right now is the most precious water on earth. And then if we treat it as precious, mm. and we recognize that what water needs in order to come back to its its vibrant, healthy state, then we can take any water and through a few really simple alchemical practices, we can bring it back to its spring quality state. So if all you have access to is smart water or all you have access to is tap water, there are a few steps that you can do to make sure that that water is going to be the most hydrating, bioavailable, living water possible. But it just does take a little bit of elbow grease and know-how. Right. What do you think about those? Have you seen those life straws? Yeah. What do you think about that? I think those are great if you're in a pinch and you've got, um, you know, really contaminated water. If you're out for a hike and you want to drink from a stream, those can be great. Okay. Yeah. I've always wanted to try one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're fantastic. You know, I used to use one a lot when I was going around uh, Central America and Guatemala and they're fantastic. Just throw in your backpack. Mm. Have you seen the waters change from country to country? Definitely. Yeah. Each country has very different water regulations. And unfortunately, right now we're kind of in a geopolitical water apartheid between the global north and the global south. Mm. So whereas we take healthy, safe drinking water for granted in this country for now, that won't be the case forever. Mm -hmm. um, that has not been the case whatsoever in the global south for decades now, actually, mm. since the 1980s, when the UN declared it the decade of um, what did they call it? The decade of public water sanitation or something like that. They declared it a whole drinking water decade and that was the focus of the UN. But unfortunately, what that actually meant was um, just the colonization of private of and the privatization of water assets and resources in the global south so that all of their water resources became so privatized that now the the water quality in those areas has just sunk below humane levels. Wow. That's scary. It's really challenging to get healthy, clean drinking water in the global South, unfortunately. And it's a big money making business. Mm. Yeah. The government's making the money, right? The governments and, and the private water cartel. So companies like Suez, Veolia, Bechtel and RWE Thames, these are probably a more powerful and dangerous cartel than even the drug cartels are. Wow. And yet most people have never heard of it. Because if you control the source of life, then you control the lives of all of those who need it as well. Mm. In fact, in Chinese, the symbol for water is the same as the symbol for control because there's this powerful relationship between water and life. Water is life, right? And so if you control the only private freshwater assets in a region, then the more polluted that region's waterways become, the more valuable your assets are. Right. It's the law of supply and demand. And so water, we all know, is more valuable than gold. Water is the blue gold, as they call it. And all of the wars of the 21st century, actually, there's a, a quote from the former UN president, who said that if the wars of the 20th century were fought over oil, the wars of the 21st century will be fought over water. And it's largely because of this privatization where they realize 
no one needs gold every day to survive, but mm. we all need water every single day to survive. And so if we can privatize that, it is the biggest money-making industry on the planet. Interesting. And growing up, we were taught that our water supply is running out, right? And they put mm. fear in us, but mm -hmm. it's something that can be replenished. In a sense, yes. If we understand how to work with the hydrological cycle, it absolutely can be. In fact, the hydrological, the above ground hydrological cycle alone, if we learn to work in harmony and in synergy with water's life cycle, I mean, mm. just like we have a life cycle, water has a life cycle. It can be young or old, healthy or sick. Most hydrologists don't have a sense of water as a living being. And so they're treating her as a completely inanimate object. And as a result, water is drying up and disappearing. Wow. But when you work in concert with the hydrological cycle, then the above ground hydrological cycle alone is more than enough to sustain all of humanity's water needs, even without tapping into the wells and the below ground water resources that were already tapped into and draining. Right. I had a doctor on here. Uh, he said there's, I think 60% of rain as glyphosate or some sort of chemical now. Are you aware of that? It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, rain is definitely largely contaminated, not, not, not to mention the aluminum that's in there, the barium, all mm. of these things. That that's scary. In the sky. As kids, we used to drink it, stick our tongues out and drink the rain, but now yeah. it's not even safe to do that. Well, maybe when we were kids, it was a little safer. I think a lot safer. Yeah. I mean, wow, that is scary. So if the rain's infected, how are we going to get more water? Well, you know, I think the measure of a healthy society is how drinkable the rivers are, is mm. how drinkable the rain is. You can't measure the health or the success of a society by economic output alone. And what's beautiful about water is that as a sentient living entity, she has these beautiful ways of cleaning and self-regulating herself when she's allowed to take her natural roots and her natural flowing courses. So the vast majority of waterways on the planet now have been artificially straightened and the vast majority of wetlands, which act as a big part of the, the filtration of the above ground hydrological cycle, have been completely wiped out. Mm. So if we were to restore the meandering pathways of rivers and restore the wetlands, then the water cycle alone can filter herself. And I think this is the route that we have to take when it comes to taking care of the watersheds that we live in, because it can't come from artificial or technological means, because again, that sets up a system where people profit from cleaning dirty water mm. more than they profit from keeping water clean in the first place. Wow, I didn't know they straightened all the rivers. That's crazy. The vast majority of rivers have been artificially straightened. Yeah, so the so what happens when when water meanders back and forth is that you get this natural switching of the spiral of the flow. So water doesn't just flow in a straight line. Water always prefers to spiral. Mm. And she kind of builds up sediment on the bottom and pushes it out to the banks, which grows a lot of um, vegetation and, oh. and lush vegetation on the banks of the river. And then the water heats up as it comes to the top and it cools down as it goes to the bottom. And throughout this whole process, she's naturally filtering and cleaning herself. But when you have just a straight riverway, then the water loses its vitality. All of the sediment kind of builds up in it. It gets a lot slower, mm. ironically speaking, because, you know, in the Western world, we think the shortest distance between point A and point B is a straight line. Right. <laughs> but that's the opposite of the way that nature works. Wow, that nature is fascinating. Nature loves to spiral. Yeah, because I had a river by my house growing up and it was super bendy. Mm -hmm. So that makes a lot of sense. And it was really fast. Yeah, and it's beautiful because you see the same thing in our bodies as well. So our bodies are basically smaller holographic projections of the Earth's larger wholeness. Our bodies have all of the same watersheds and hydrological cycles that the Earth does. And so just as water in nature spirals, all of the water in our body spirals as well. You know, mm. you have spiral striations on the inside of your veins that causes the blood to spiral, which is what gives it that momentum to get all the way through your little capillaries and everything. Your cerebral spinal fluid, you know, in German, the word for spinal column is spiral column. The word mm. for vertebrae is vortices because your CSF spirals up and down your spine. Uh, you know, even next time you pee, maybe look down at your urethra and notice that even your pee comes out in a spiral. And so there's wow. so much that we can learn from these patterns of water in nature that teach us how to take better care of our bodies and how to better take care of our drinking water as well. So one of the primary ways that we actually bring dormant water back to life is through using spirals and through mm. using vortexes. Vortexing the water is one of the best ways to re-enliven, reinvigorate, aerate, and structure it. Have you seen those water bottles that do that? 
Yeah. The tornado ones. What do you think of those? I love those. Yeah. I had, there's a bunch of them at, uh, on water is life.shop. We have the Mayu ones. We have the portable ones. We have some that are just, um, like using magnetic stirrers. Mm. We have, um, some portable immersion vortexes. It's definitely one of my favorite methods of structuring water. Wow. I'm going to have to get one of those. Yeah. There's so many beautiful water alchemy tools out there. I kind of geek out on this <laughs> aspect of it. I've got a water laboratory at home and you can enliven water in so many fun ways. Oh yeah. That's mm -hmm. cool. Have you tested your hydration levels? Yeah. You're yeah. 12, aren't you? Not quite, not <laughs> quite, but I'm getting there. You know, what's beautiful is actually one of the most effective things that I've heard of for raising phase angle, which is generally a pretty slow metric to shift, mm. but actually Ophora water, when you bathe in Ophora water, it raises your phase angle what? considerably in a really short period of time. I'm going to have to dump like 20 of these in a tub then. I know, me too. I want to try it. Even though they're like 40 each. <laughs> <laughs> Spend 800 bucks on a bath. Hey, you know what? Health is the best investment. Yeah, it is. I, when I started investing in health, my business skyrocketed actually. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've noticed the same thing. You know, they say that when you, um, when you hydrate, you heal and health as well. Yeah, because so. I used to neglect it, but it's not worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's easy to neglect it when you're younger too, because you just think you're young, but time oh, yeah. catches up. We, we take it all for granted when we're younger. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so you said water has a consciousness. Does mm -hmm. that mean you're able to kind of communicate with it and understand it better? Absolutely. So it's been said that water is the glove on the hand of consciousness itself, and that water is actually the physical manifestation of consciousness, that there's nothing that is conscious that doesn't have water flowing through it in some sense. We know that water is life, and yet water is so far beyond just living beings as well. Water is all throughout the cosmos. Water is everywhere in nature, and wherever there is water, there is consciousness, where there is sentience. There mm. is this, this seeing, this feeling, this this sensory organ of the earth and you can see this in numerous different studies that have been done by all kinds of researchers um, a lot of people watching this are probably already familiar with the work of dr emoto who showed water's responsiveness to different stimuli in its environment a dear friend and colleague of mine veda austin has mm -hmm. also shown water's consciousness and not only its ability to reflect its environment but also to communicate proactively using something that she calls hydroglyphs, where water can actually communicate and give certain symbols and understandings. And this field is actually called hydromancy. It's water divination, the ability to communicate and commune reciprocally with water. Uh, there was another researcher that I really love named Professor Bern Kroplin, who showed that water droplets, depending on their maturity, depending on the influences that they've been exposed to, will interact with each other differently, that there's actually communication signals taking place between different water droplets. There is an, another, another amazing researcher named um, Dr. Andreas Schultz, who developed another water crystallography method that shows that water is actively responding to its environment in a very communicative way, in the same way that we do. And in this way, I love to not just look at modern science, which of course can teach us so much, but really look at ancient indigenous water wisdom teachings and practices and mm. holy water uh, teachings and practices from the scriptures and the ancient religions. And what you see across the board in all of those teachings is that water acts as this mediator between the manifest and the non-manifest world, mm. that it acts as kind of this point of translation between the human and the heavenly you know, the Kogi tribe of Colombia, they say that all of reality is just the dreaming of water and that water contains the matrix of reality, that it is kind of what forms the hologram of this existence that we're in, mm. whether we're talking about um, the dreaming world to the structures of daily life, to the visions that you receive in medicine ceremonies, that actually all of these are patterned and programmed by water. Wow. That is crazy. I'm big on dreams. So how exactly mm. does water influence the dream world? The dream world takes place entirely within water. So your cerebral spinal fluid, which is only one molecule different from seawater. Mm. Dr. Randolph Stone said that the CSF is where this is where the soul actually swims. And there's mm. this incredible researcher who got his MD and his PhD from Harvard. His name is Dr. Mauro Zapatera. And he studies the way that our super consciousness is actually conducted through our CSF and through our, our bio waters in different ways, but specifically the CSF. So within the central ventricle of the brain, 
which many ancient cultures referred to as the cave of Brahman or mm. the crystal palace. Um, there's this constant flow of CSF. There's this ebb and flow of CSF. And right in the front of it is the pineal gland and right behind it is the pituitary gland. Mm. And they're always secreting, you know, melatonin, potentially even the upgraded metabolites of melatonin, like dimethyltryptamine, which gets released in small amounts during dreaming. And your CSF is so piezoelectric that it is emitting light all the time. In fact, wow. the relationship between water and light in general is fascinating. We can get into that if you want, but specifically with the CSF, there's this biophotonic radiation. So you're always emitting light within your spine and your central ventricle and these ventricles of the brain all the time. Now, your pineal gland has photoreceptors on it. So it's always kind of peering and gazing into this lake of light with its ebbs and its flows, just like the tide all the time. And it is said that a particular um, surface in the brain called the massa intermedia is actually where our visions of reality and where our dream states, the visions that we receive in dream states are actually um, projected almost like onto a projector screen. Mm. Now, because the CSF is so, so highly crystalline, it's so incredibly well structured that it's like this matrix of light. And you can literally think of it as like this holographic world that your consciousness is able to enter into when you're sleeping. Wow. I love that. Yeah. I keep a dream journal. I take dreams very serious. Think, Beautiful. I think there's a lot of meaning in dreams. Oh, so much. I love that. Do you do lucid dreaming? Uh, not as much as I'd like. Mm. I, I want to do it more often. Do you lucid dream a lot? I love lucid dreaming. I used to do it a, a, quite a lot as a practice and then I've caught and fallen off with it in the past few years. But if you're a big dreamer, here's a, a water-related practice that okay. you can kind of play around with. And this comes from Veda Austin, the researcher and friend that I was mentioning before. So you get a Petri dish mm. with just a tiny little bit of water in there. So if, if you were to tip the Petri dish over, the water would only fill about 25% of the Petri dish. Okay. I would, if you... Picture it in fourths. It would fill about a Got fourth it. when you tip it over. So it's a very small amount. You set the Petri dish next to your bedside table while you're dreaming. Go to sleep, wake up the next morning and put it in the fridge or sorry, in the freezer for about five minutes. Mm. Just enough. And every freezer is calibrated a little bit differently, but just enough to where you have a layer of frozen water and a layer of liquid water on top of that. Mm. Tip out the layer of liquid water and then hold the Petri dish up to the light and take some photos because it's going to melt really quickly. So you have to take the photos right away. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating because you will see in the crystallography something that will jog your memory of exactly what you dreamed that night. What? In the vast majority of cases. I'm trying that tonight. That is awesome. It's so fun to play with. That is super fun. I want to end off with the relationship between water and light because you mentioned that earlier. Are they really connected? Absolutely. Yeah. So in a couple of different ways. So we think of water as being H2O, and that is the matter side of water. But for every one part matter, for every one part H2O, there are a trillion parts photons, mm. a trillion parts light to one part matter. In fact, Dr. Masaru Emoto said that realizing that water exists at some point as light is one of the most important keys to understanding our universe. And one of my favorite water researchers, Dolph Santiga, says that Light is just information that has to be brought in by the right water. So the only effect that light takes on living beings is through the phase changes of water. So water's primary role is to translate light frequencies into biological information. So when you drink water that has the full spectrum of light frequencies within it, you notice profound shifts in your biology. Mm. It can entirely restore a depleted gut microbiome. It can, within just a few minutes, actually give you brainwave coherence. So your left and your right brain, uh, sides of your brain, actually sync up within a few minutes of just drinking the right kind of water. And they've also done third-party, um, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials to show that you actually can reverse your biological age wow. based on the glycan age test just by drinking full spectrum, light informed water. Most of us are drinking water that has been under nothing but fluorescent lights or in darkness from the time that it was artificially pumped up right. through a well. When you get more light information in your water, 
it shifts everything. So the currently the best thing on the market for that is called the Analemma wand. It's also at waterislife.shop. Mm. And it's incredible because you get the entire full spectrum of not only sunlight, but also moonlight and starlight in your water. Totally. This is what all of our ancestors were drinking. Yeah. And it, it enlivens you in a completely different way. Is it like a filter? Is it a light? How does it work? So it's a wand it's that a wand. contains a mother water within it. And through the properties of epitaxy and transference, which is just a, a scientific law that states that something that is at a higher level of coherence will bring more order to anything incoherent in its environment. Mm. So you stir your water with this particular, uh, uh, this wand, basically. It's like just like a stirring rod that has this mother water in it, and it translates that information into your drinking mm. water. I'm going to get one today. That sounds awesome. And it's, it's pretty exciting that it lowers your biological age too. Yeah. It, within 99% of the participants of the study, they did a glycan age test and they showed that within three months of drinking the water, it lowered their age by one to 12 years. Holy crap. That's a lot. That's a lot. Just from that. And that's probably pretty affordable for some people are spending thousands on their health trying to lower their age and be healthier, but this mm -hmm. sounds pretty affordable and easy to use. Water is always the best place to start when it comes to any health strategy. We are water, so let's keep it simple and, and start with water as the primary measurement of health. I love it. Where can people find out your store and more about you? Yeah, so you can find the shop at waterslife.shop. You can find all of my courses, webinars, one-on-one -on -one consultations, um, all kinds of educational content at waterslife.academy. Um, there's also waterislife.love that has all kinds of free resources, YouTube videos, stuff like that. And then I'm also on Instagram a lot at Jen Isabel Friend. Perfect. We'll link it all below. Thanks for coming Great. on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching, guys. As always, check out the shop below and see you tomorrow.